Hello, and welcome to Wingham United Church. This service is being prepared for Good Friday of 2022, which falls on April the 15th. Our call to worship for this service comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 19 to 21. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and we love darkness rather than light. For God sent the Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, but all who do what is true come to the light. Come, let us worship together in spirit and in truth. Today's service is a little different. It follows with some creative liberties taken, the tradition of tenebrae, which is the Latin word for darkness. We begin the service by lighting first the Christ candle. And then from the Christ candle's flame, we light the rest of our tenebrae candles. It is in this way, representatively at least, that Christ's light shines from all of our candles. Now, as we make our way through the story of Jesus' crucifixion, at various stages of his horrific journey, we will extinguish one of the candles until at the moment of Jesus' death, we extinguish the Christ candle itself. But let us begin with prayer. Most gracious God, look with mercy upon your children for whom our Lord Jesus was betrayed, given into sinful hands and suffered death upon the cross. Strengthen our faith and forgive our betrayals as we enter the way of his passion. Through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. Our opening hymn sings of the events of the last night, what we now call Maundy Thursday, the last meal with his disciples, the blessed sacrament bestowed, and one last poignant lesson about service and humility. Then it's off to the garden and Good Friday. Our opening hymn is number 130 in Voices United, an upper room did our Lord prepare. <laughs>
call this Good Friday seems a paradox. How can we gather to mark someone's death, a cruel, tortured execution, and call it good? It is dark and somber, as our service will be. With the Tenebrae service, we gradually darken our space as one by one the Lenten candles are extinguished, as step by step we move closer and closer to Jesus' death, and finally extinguish the Christ candle. There are no brightly colored eggs today. We do not shout hallelujah. We are not here to celebrate, and yet we call this day good. Yet there can be no Easter without Good Friday, no Easter eggs without the cross. Life leads to death and death leads to resurrection. It is not to be avoided or minimized. To do so would be to forget the awful price Jesus paid for our place in the kingdom of God. In our worship this week, we have already lived through a broad range of emotion from the celebratory highs of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem to the dark mood of the upper room where Jesus shared his final meal with his closest friends and revealed to them his betrayer. We have waved palms in joyous parade and we have tasted of the bread and the cup in solemn communion. Today, we sink deeper into that darkness that will soon envelop the land. Today, we acknowledge our role in Christ's death, our sin. We know that Jesus had the power to avoid all this. He could have hidden himself from the crowd that came to arrest him. He could have defended himself before Pilate. He could have called down an army of angels to carry him away, but he didn't. If he had, we would all have been lost. Jesus' mission was to teach us about our mission. Jesus came to redirect us back toward God and to break humanity's obsession with the material world. To teach us this lesson, Jesus denied his material self and willingly turned it over to be destroyed so that we could learn from him that our true self lies in the spirit. Our real life is revealed through his resurrection. But there can be no resurrection without death. And so for our sakes, Jesus died. In the epistle to the Hebrews, the author quotes an ancient prophecy. This is the new covenant I will make. With my people on that day, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. In his death, Jesus offers himself as our final sacrifice and the sign of the new covenant that God makes with us. All we need has been provided. All we must know has been taught to us. Ours is only to accept by faith what God has given in grace. As we take this time to remember the sacrifice of our Lord, may the Holy Spirit reveal to us the truth of God's infinite and incredible love. We take time now to remember the last hours of Jesus' life, as told in the Gospel of John, chapters 18 and 19. The Last Supper has been eaten. Jesus and his followers have left the upper room. That part of the story is retold in hymn 133, Go to Dark Gethsemane.
Jesus crossed the Kidron Valley with his disciples and entered a grove of olive trees. Judas, the betrayer, knew this place because Jesus had often gone there with his disciples. The leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him. Now with blazing torches, lanterns and weapons, they arrived at the olive grove. Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him. So he stepped forward to meet them. Who are you looking for? He asked. Jesus the Nazarene, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. As Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. Once more, he asked them, who are you looking for? And again, they replied, Jesus, the Nazarene. I told you that I am he, Jesus said. And since I am the one you want, let these others go. He did this to fulfill his own statement. I did not lose a single one of those you have given me. Then Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's slave. But Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their commanding officer and the temple guards arrested Jesus and tied him up. First they took him to Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest at the time. Caiaphas was the one who had told the other Jewish leaders, it is better that one man die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, as did another of the disciples. That other disciple was acquainted with the high priest, so he was allowed to enter the high priest's courtyard with Jesus. Peter had to stay outside the gate. Then the disciple, who knew the high priest, spoke to the woman watching at the gate, and she let Peter in. The woman asked Peter, You're not one of that man's disciples, are you? No, he said, I am not. Because it was cold, the household servants and the guards had made a charcoal fire. They stood around it, warming themselves, and Peter stood with them, warming himself. Inside, the high priest began asking Jesus about his followers and what he'd been teaching them. Jesus replied, Everyone knows what I teach. I have preached regularly in the synagogues and the temple where the people gather. I have not spoken in secret. Why are you asking me this question? Ask those who heard me. They know what I said. Then one of the temple guards standing nearby slapped Jesus across the face. Is that the way to answer the high priest, he demanded? Jesus replied, if I said anything wrong, you must prove it. But if I am speaking the truth, why are you beating me? Then Annas bound Jesus and sent him to Caiaphas, the high priest, Meanwhile, as Simon Peter was standing by the fire warming himself, they asked him again, You're not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, No, I am not. But one of the household slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Didn't I see you out there in the olive grove with Jesus? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately a rooster crowed. Jesus' trial before Caiaphas ended in the early hours of the morning. Then he was taken to the headquarters of the Roman governors. His accusers didn't go inside because it would defile them, and they wouldn't be allowed to celebrate the Passover. So Pilate, the governor, went out to them and asked, What is your charge against this man? We wouldn't have handed him over to you if he weren't a criminal, they retorted. Then take him away and judge him by your own law, Pilate told them. Only the Romans are permitted to execute someone, the Jewish leaders replied. This fulfilled Jesus' prediction about the way he would die. Then Pilate went back into his headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews? He asked him. Jesus replied, 
Is this your own question? Or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew? Peter Pilate retorted. Your own people and their leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from be being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate said, so you are a king. Jesus responded, you say that I am a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. What is truth? Pilate asked. Then he went out again to the people and told them he is not guilty of any crime. But you have a custom of asking me to release one prisoner each year at Passover. Would you like me to re release this king of the Jews? But they shouted back, no, not this man. We want Barabbas. Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate had Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put a purple robe on him. Hail, king of the Jews, they mocked as they slapped him across the face. Pilate went outside again and said to the people, I'm going to bring him out to you now, but understand clearly that I find him not guilty. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said, Look, here's the man. When they saw him, the leading priests and temple guards began shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! Take him yourselves and crucify him, Pilate said. I find him not guilty. The Jewish leaders replied, by our law, he ought to die because he called himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was more frightened than ever. He took Jesus back into the headquarters again and asked him, where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Why don't you talk to me, Pilate demanded. Don't you realize that I have the power to release you or crucify you? Then Pilate said, you would have no power over me at all, unless it were given to you from above. So the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Then Pilate tried to release him, but the Jewish leader shouted, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who declares himself a king is a rebel against Caesar. When they said this, Pilate brought Jesus out to them again. And then Pilate sat down on the judgment seat on the platform that is called the stone pavement in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was now about noon on the day of preparation for the Passover. And Pilate said to the people, look, here is your king. Away with him, they yelled. Away with him. Crucify him. What? Pilate asked. Crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar, the leading priests shouted back. And Pilate turned Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus away. Carrying the cross by himself, he went to the place called Place of the Skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they nailed him to the cross. Two others were crucified with him, one on either side, with Jesus between them. And Pilate posted a sign on the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Hebrew, Latin and Greek, so that many people could read it. 
Then the leading priests objected and said to Pilate, Change it from the king of the Jews to, He said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate replied, No, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they divided his clothes among the four of them. They also took his robe, but it was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said, rather than tearing it apart, let's throw dice for it. This fulfilled the scripture that says they divided my garments among them and threw dice for my clothing. So that is what they did. Standing near the cross were Jesus' mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. And he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from then on, this disciple took her into his home. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. And to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put it on a hyssop branch, and held it to his lips. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and released his spirit.
in the book of the prophet Isaiah, there is a passage called the Song of the Suffering Servant. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrow that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong. He had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. May Jesus Christ, who for our sake became obedient unto death, even death on the cross, keep you and strengthen you this day and forever. Amen.